put on my radio voice. Ooh. <laughs> your deep, sexy voice. <laughs> We're here today with Glowbug Young. No, I can't. I can't do. I can't do that for an hour. Right? That, that'd no, be... Yeah, don't do that. Hey, we, we are here with uh, Gloria Young, the mother of Justin Robert Young, um, and in and of herself, her own celebrity on Diamond Club. Uh, by request from our, our live viewers, actually, this that's where this came in. And um, this is going to go pretty much directly to Patreon for a while, and then we'll probably release it as part of a supplemental episode uh, a little bit later. Uh, but we want to give, give thanks to those who came up with the ideas and stuff like that, and, and they were definitely our patrons. So... Without further ado, uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Amos. I don't matter at all. That's Kent over there. Um, Kent, say hi. He doesn't matter at all either. He's completely inconsequential. The only person that matters today is Gloria Glowbug Young. Um, Say hi to everybody that's that's listening. Hey, everyone. Good, Good afternoon, morning, evening, internet. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for asking for me. Now, if yeah, you were on. if you were on your drive into work right now, you might want to slow down, let a couple cars pass, because I have a feeling that you're not going to want to turn this one off until uh, in, until it's completely done. You don't want to get to work and well, I mean, if you get a good parking lot, I guess stop and get some McDonald's, eat some breakfast burritos, and uh, on your way in. <laughs> um, this is a this is a special occasion for us. This is one of those times when we are we we have been entrusted with the care and handling of one of our podcasting idols, uh, family members, which is odd to say, but wonderful to happen. So, Kent, um, where would you go if you if you could ask Glowbug Young anything that you wanted to ask? Where would you start? I say we kind of start at the beginning. I, I'm really curious about the life and times of Gloria Young. I'm, I'm really curious about where you grew up. Uh, what was your childhood like? like how, what was it like for you growing up? Oh, that's, that's simple. Uh, actually, I was born in uh, Queens, New York. And when I was just a baby, we moved out to Long Island to a little town called Beth Page. Next town over was Levittown. Most people know that. And um, I had two older brothers. My mother was 40 years old when I was born, so I was a surprise. (laughs) My brothers were already 11 and 13 by the time I was born. So I was sort of, um, you know, like, oh, by the way, here, you're going to have another baby. And and my mom was absolutely thrilled. She was a stay-at-home mom, so she said that I just... You know, reignited her life and her excitement. So I always felt very loved and very special. And um, my two big brothers were, you know, they were already to the stage where they were kind of doing their own thing. So I was almost to some extent like an only child. Um, but I had a very happy childhood in, in growing up in Long Island. We had a nice little house. We had a pool in the backyard. It was very middle class neighborhood. Um, everything was really good until it came time for the Vietnam War, when my brothers were of age and my father had fought in World War II, and he was of the opinion that my brothers should go to war to fight for the country, and my brothers were absolutely no, I don't want to have anything to do with this stupid war. So at that point, I remember a lot of yelling and screaming in the house because there was disagreement, but for the most part, Everything was really good. My dad uh, all of a sudden um, came up with some symptoms of heart condition. And by the time I was 12 years old, they told uh, my dad had a couple of angina attacks. They told him, you have to go move to a warm climate. So we moved to Florida when I was 12. That was 1971. So uh, my brothers at that time were already grown up. My, the younger of the two brothers was already married, so they did not come with us. We moved to Florida. I was very unhappy. I had left my friends, my family. I was not a happy camper. And it was a critical age, too. Um, so, you know, I spent about a year or so being depressed, not speaking to my parents because they moved me away. And then finally, you know, started school, made some friends, 
But of course, you know, South Florida in the 70s, there was a lot of stuff going around, a lot of things that I would never have encountered had I stayed in New York. I mean, drugs were everywhere. And um, I was young and impressionable. And I probably did some foolish things, but nevertheless made it through and um, graduated from high school and um, decided I did not want to go to college at the time. I got a job right out of high school at a law firm. And I started working for a very prestigious attorney as a second assistant secretary to him. And I learned a lot. I grew up a lot in that very professional environment. And then I learned um, that I needed to go back to school. So I went off to Florida State for a little while. I was trying to get as far away from my parents as I possibly could. And Florida State's up in Tallahassee. It was about a nine hour drive at the time. And I'm like, okay, that's good. I'm still in the state of Florida, but I'm far away from home. So I stayed there for about three months, hated it. Uh, One semester and I came back to South Florida and um, basically just started loving my life at that time. I finally was a little bit more self-confident, sort of came out of my shyness shell because I was quite shy all through high school. Um, And, um, you know, I was still working at the law firm. I was going to school. I was really just having a great time. That was probably one of the, some of the best times of my life. I was independent. I had money to spend, although I was still living at my parents' house. And my next plan was to get out of there. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I met my husband and, uh, the father of my two sons. So once I met him, Um, things intensified fairly quickly. My father was very upset with me because I was not doing what he wanted me to do. We got in a big argument and I moved out and I moved in with my, um, boyfriend at the time, my husband to be. And about a year later we got married. Mm. And, um, once we got married, we moved, we moved quite a bit. He had jobs that were either he was transferred, promoted, or he changed companies or whatever. So we lived in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Then we moved um, moved back here to South Florida for a short while. Then we moved out to Fort Worth, Texas, and that was where Justin was born. That was the uh, early 80s. And um, after that, we moved to Orlando. And um, then out to San Diego, California. And that was where we got divorced and uh, came back here to South Florida. So <laughs> that kind of brings you up. That was about, that was about uh, 10, 15 years worth of time there. A little bit more. So, so all roads yeah. lead to South Florida is what you're saying. So I wound up coming back to South Florida <laughs> mainly because I was out there in California with two little boys. My boys were four and seven at the mm. time. Nobody to help me not getting any child support. And uh, I knew I needed to come back to be close to family for them to help me out with yeah. my, my boys. So yeah. that's why I, I wound up back here. I, I grew up in Southern California as a, as the, the son of a, of a single mom and it's uh, expensive out there. It's, it's ungodly expensive, even back in the nineties. And that so. was the problem. I would have loved to have stayed there because San Diego was probably one of the most beautiful places on earth. I'm not exactly sure where you were in Southern Cal, but San Diego was, it's beautiful. The weather's perfect, but the cost was just out of control, crazy. Yeah. And um, I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't swing it by myself with two little boys. So yeah. Um, but, in fact, 90 90- because you moved back to Florida right around 1990, right? 90, 91. Yeah, it's, it's about the time uh, that we bailed on, on California and moved to Indiana, which is where I met Kent. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gloria, you mentioned how important family is. You recently discovered a part of your family that you didn't even know existed previously. Yes. Tell, yes. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a very interesting story because... Um, My father actually had a a fairly um, kind of a tragic uh, first 15 or so years of his life. His his mother and father came over as young immigrants, 1906. They landed in Ellis Island. They 
they got married in Italy and they took off on one of those boats that took all the immigrants and they, you know, just like thousands and thousands of others, a young couple. I think my grandmother was 19. My grandfather at the time was 28, something like that. And they came to the U.S. to, you know, start their lives. They had five children, one right after the next, three girls, a boy, which was my father, and another girl. And after the fifth child was born within the within two years after the last child was born my grandmother died so my grandfather was left with five children ages 10 8 6 4 2 little kids and he was an immigrant he struggled to speak english so he did what he could to make a living moved from Pennsylvania, where they originally were living, into New York, into Queens, to try and maybe find some more work. So he would go to work during the day and leave the older girls taking care of all the kids. Well, day after day after day, that went on. The kids were crying. Um, the authorities came and took all the children away. They put the three older girls in an orphanage. They put my father in one orphanage and they put the baby in another orphanage. So the kids really had no idea what was going on. They didn't know what to think. My father was just a young boy, four or five years old at the time. Um, my grandfather worked for years and years to try and find all the kids, to bring them back together, finally got everybody back together again and he was walking home from mass on Christmas Eve and he was hit by a car and killed. Oh so God. by the time my father was 15 years old, he was an orphan. He had no family. And he was old enough that his father talked about his homeland, but never talked about having brothers and sisters. So all this time, we thought we had no other family in Sicily. So on a whim, a few years ago, I went on to Ancestry.com and I started to build my family tree. And, you know, I put in my grandmother and grandfather because I found that when the Ellis Island website came out, it was real popular about 15 years ago or whatever. And they're like, oh, search for your descendants. And, you know, so we did our ascendants. So we did. I found them. and. Um, so I had that little bit of information and I posted that on my mother's side of the family, on the, the German side, my cousins had found family back to the 1600s. But on, this, on the, my father's side of the family, all I knew was my grandmother and grandfather's name. That was it. So mysteriously, one day at work, I get uh, a voicemail, a very long voicemail from a woman claiming to be helping to find the descendants of Paolo Anzalone, which was my grandfather, here in the United States, that the Italian cousins have been looking for the American cousins, and there was one elderly, uh, she would have been, I think, a cousin to my grandfather that was it's still alive, 30. and she was very interested to know what happened to the American cousins. So sure enough, after a few more investigatory efforts and all of this, we finally started to communicate. And it turns out that my grandfather was one of six. He had five brothers and sisters. Found it odd that he never mentioned them to my father. I don't know why. Um, but at any rate, so there was all of this family and, um, in October of last year, I went ahead and made my mission to go out there to Sicily and I met all of these distant cousins and it was so heartwarming. Everyone came from, I mean, they've moved all over. They live in Milan, they live in Bo uh, Bulgaria, they live in uh, outside of Rome. I mean, from wherever they were, they came to Sicily to the, the main cousin's house to meet me. They threw a surprise party for me. They just made me feel so warm and loved. It was, it was just, it was so heartwarming. It was just an awesome experience. 
that absolutely is absolutely awesome experience. I love that story. That is so great to uh, not only to find, like basically find where you came from, but also just to be accepted so immediately. It's that's just it, that's wonderful. You know, and that's what blew me away more than anything. I, I thought, you know, I have lots of family and cousins here in the U.S., but we don't really keep in touch and we've just grown apart so much over the years. And we never really, you know, a lot of families where all the cousins kind of grew up so close together. I didn't have that. We always lived far away from our cousins and most of my cousins were much older than me. So I just didn't have that closeness with my American cousins. But after spending one week with my distant Italian cousins, I felt like, I felt like they cared about me more than, than any of the other family that I've ever known. So this is this is actually um, something I can distinctly uh, uh, identify with because when we left California, we went to Indiana. Um, I had grown up in California with my aunt Paul and uncle Bob and my cousin uh, cousins uh, Brian and Bobby, and it was like that was that was always that was always Thanksgiving, that was Christmas, you know, all the holidays. That was the the family. My mom, her brother, and his family. Right. And then my grandparents, when they were alive and when they were there, you know, but that was my core family. And then we leave California. We leave Aunt Paul and Uncle Bob behind. We move out to Indiana to be with my grandparents because they were a- ailing and they were getting, you know, older and everything else. That first Thanksgiving, when I'm meeting all these people, all these cousins that I remember from when I was like three years old, when I, you know, last time I saw them and this and that, you know, right. um, cousins, cousins I'd only ever heard of, family members I'd only ever heard of. That feeling, those two or three years there where we were all doing Thanksgiving and Christmas together, that was home. And when I think back of like, how do I want my kids to remember the holidays? It's that moment. And I, these are people that I hadn't seen in 12, well, 10 or 12 years. And I was only yeah. 12 or 13 years old at the time, you know, yeah. and, and it was it, it, that, that that genuine feeling of, wow, this is what family this is supposed is to be. Family like. is all about. So instead of being family, Aunt Paul and Uncle Bob, now is this family just, where's Aunt Paul and Uncle Bob? Like they should be here. You know, it yeah. was not like these people are all strangers. It was just, it was, it was wonderful. And so now when I look back, that's what I think of. Um, I mean, the yeah. distance isn't, isn't as great, obviously, but yeah, I, I, that, that same feeling of, of, wow, this is, you know, and that, now I still talk to them on Facebook and stuff like that, but even they've moved off and it's just so different and distant now. Yeah. 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 I, I actually, I wish that the uh, economy in Italy was not so poor, especially in Sicily, because I would move my entire family there if I could. That's how, <laughs> that's how much I loved it. It was absolutely just awesome. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the country itself. Like, how? What was the experience of being in Italy? You know, family aside, what was the, the experience of being in Italy? Language barrier, uh, custom barriers, things like that. How was that for you? Yeah, well, you know, we were in Sicily first because my family is actually from Sicily. So uh, we spent about four days in Sicily, and um, the country was very nice. It actually reminded me a lot of California. Uh, kind of northern California. It kind of had like rolling hills and um, just very scenic. And of course, it's it's a little island, so it's surrounded by water and and there's beautiful beaches. And um, I I really was quite impressed with with Sicily. And um, and you know the language barrier was a little frustrating. Thank God for Google Translate because you know we use that quite a bit. And um, you know, I all I wanted to do, I was so curious. I wanted to just ask so many questions. I, I wanted to know everything about their government and their economy and their gun laws and their health care. And I wanted to know about how do they do it here. I, I just wanted to be educated. So. Working through Google Translate was a little frustrating. <laughs> right. You know, I got minimal. Um, I got minimal information, but I did have like one of the one of the cousins, a couple of the younger cousins, spoke a little bit of English, so they helped out a little bit when they were around. Um, and then we went up to um, we went up to Florence also, and um, then from there we did a tour around the lakes, like Lake Como and the Northern Lakes, just north of Milan. And I mean, the countryside was beautiful. Um, 
people were very friendly. I had no problems. I never really felt like I was not safe. Uh, the only time I felt a little sketchy was when we were in the train station in Milan. You know, there were yeah. quite a few kind of derelicts hanging around and made me feel a little uncomfortable. But for the most part, <clears throat> I just loved it. I mean, I would go back again. I found it to be very affordable. Um, mm -hmm. The weather was perfect. We were there at a really good time. And um, I loved it. I mean, there's a lot more to see there. And I would go back again. Yeah. What, sure. what time of year? What time of year were you there? We were there. We got there the last day of September, and we were there like the first ten days of October. Hmm. Okay, that's probably a, a really good time to go. I, the first time that I was in Italy, because I, I lived in Europe for five years. As, ah. As, and uh, the first time that I was in Italy, we went to Rome in August, and that was a mistake. It was <laughs> incredibly hot. Uh, yeah. About a hundred percent humidity. And I mean, the temperatures were probably hovering around 100, and it was so miserable. brutal. Yeah. 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 I can imagine. So, so exactly I how imagine. I imagine Florida, or how I remember Florida from the two times I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Florida summers are brutal. Um, basically, the way the North and the Northeast and the Midwest hunker down for winters, and you kind of just stay in. I mean, down here in Florida during the heat of the summer, unless you have a boat or you're in a pool or you're out there fishing or water skiing or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't want to be outside. It's, you know, it's just brutal. You can't even walk on the sand at the beach. It's so damn hot. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, Gloria, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, about what it was like raising Justin and Eric. Uh, we all know Justin as this, uh, like, goofball, you know, always wanting to make people laugh or, uh, be, just be an entertaining person. Was he like that as a child as well? Um, you know, he was for the most part. I mean, as a young boy, he was he was very sweet. He was a good little kid. But then he became the older brother. And mm. once he became the older brother and he found that he had a little brother that he could play jokes on and, you know, tease. And he just jumped right into that. And, um, you know, so he, he did always have a passion for, for comedy. There is no doubt about that. I mean, even as, as young as probably like in the sixth grade, I remember him always wanting to make people laugh. There's, um, he, he definitely had that tendency from, from the get go, but, um, you know, he's also when he was in kindergarten, they found, they tested his, his intelligence level and he was at an incredibly high IQ. So he, that's what he gets from his dad. He did get some really good qualities from his dad. He got his dad's brilliance. And, um, and I'm, I'm thrilled about that. He's a hundred times smarter than I am. And he's probably a lot smarter than his brother. Um, and he just has this incredible, um, I, I guess it's just this, like he's fearless. He's just fearless. He's, he's never been intimidated. Um, you know, he'll get up on stage and I can remember at one point when he was a, I think he was a senior in high school and he had won, uh, one of the small scholarships he got was by like the Young Democrats Society or something. And at that time, he was a big McCain fan, he was a Republican. <laughs> and when he went to accept the, um, the scholarship, he had a McCain T-shirt and he went up to the podium and thanked them for the scholarship and then threw out this McCain T-shirt. And everybody just... <gasps> In the audience, they just gasped. All the Democrats were just freaking out that he was so brazen to do something like that. And even I was embarrassed. I'm like, oh, God, Justin, how could you possibly have done that? But, you know, it just didn't phase him. Whatever he thought, it, he never thought twice. It, whatever is in his mind, it just comes out. He doesn't care about what anybody thinks or the consequences. That's just him. And you see that today. That's well, great. That. Oh my gosh, that is a wonderful story. Yeah. I mean, he blew my mind with that one. <laughs> and then actually, we even found some, um, 
you know, when he moved, when he left college and came back home and then he left again and he left me all these bins of his junk, you know, that he's accumulated over the years. And we were looking back at one point he had me looking for something and I'm looking through all these bins and I found something that he drew of, it was supposed to be him. I think he was in sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade. And it was him standing on a stage with a little bubble over his head, uh, making jokes. And so, you know, even at that young age, that's what he wanted to do. And he did stand up comedy, in fact, in, in college. And he did it in New York City for a while. He did it when he was in high school. Um, it's just always been a passion for him. When did uh, uh when, when did when did politics become something that he was so enamored by? Because he talks about how he's been like a, a lifelong fan of the process of he, the show. He, he was he was always into politics. I mean, when he was in high school, he um, you know, he ran for student council, and he ran as uh, for vice president. Because I think he didn't really want to work that hard, but he wanted to be involved. <laughs> and so he, at that time, he was already growing a lot of facial hair. And so he did all of his posters compared him to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so he had photos of himself and photos of Abraham Lincoln side by side. And that was his whole pitch because... <laughs> He had facial hair and so did Abraham Lincoln. And that would make him a great vice president of student council. And he won. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. I now, love it. You know, I think I might still have some of the posters that he made. I think they're probably in my closet here somewhere. But um, I should pull some of those out someday, take a few photos and text them to him so he has them. And he'll get a big kick out of that. Definitely, definitely. Oh man. Oh man. So, Avis, um do you are you ready to talk about the uh the letter that I wrote? Or do you yeah. want to play that clip or okay, so Gloria, um I really love the relationship that you and Justin have. Like it's mm -hmm. it's, it's actually reminds me a lot of my relationship with my mother. Um unfortunately I, I lost my mom a couple of years back. Oh, and, oh. Uh, after after she passed, I actually wrote a letter to Justin. And he read it on his show. And I think I think Amos has the, the clip pulled up. Mm -hmm. I wanted to play that for you. And I wanted to get your reaction to to Justin's response to my letter. Oh, OK. I would love Can't... to hear that. Hi, Justin. Just listened to your mother episode of The Jury Show. I enjoyed it very much. And I applaud you for the love and respect you show your mom. My mom passed away about a month ago. It is one of the most difficult things I've had to endure like yours, my mother was always my greatest supporter and most vocal cheerleader. Whenever it seemed like the whole world was against me, I could call my mom and she uh, would remind me that I was loved and reinstill my confidence in myself. That has been extremely valuable to me throughout my life, even as I recently, as a couple months ago, and I'm 38. I'm very saddened that I will never hear her reassuring voice again. I quite often reach for my phone to text her only to remember that she's gone. I'll miss her greatly. I guess the point of this email is to say that moms are special and that they should be celebrated and not taken for granted. I'm delighted that you display that low level of respect, admiration, and love to your mom. I sincerely hope that you have several more decades with that special lady. Number one, my mom will never die. And uh, I'm just going to keep rolling with that until uh, I get proved wrong. Number two, uh, I, I want... Everybody, you know, when, when when it comes to stuff like this, I think we get really myopic about like, oh, mom, dad, blood, family, that kind of stuff. I want everybody to just, you know, think of there. Everyone has a person. Hopefully, hopefully, you have a person in your life that fits the description that Kent just gave. And if that's your mom, rad. If that's your dad, rad. You know, for me, it very much is my mom, but it's also a lot of other people. And 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 I don't want people to just get mixed up with like the fact that like, you know, well, I have a shitty relationship with my mom or I have a shitty relationship with my dad because like, just go ahead and thank the person that has been there for you, you know, regardless of their relationship and family to you. Uh, thank you, Kent, for writing in. Phil writes. Oh, that was sweet. Very touching. I'm sorry for your loss, Kent. Um, 
You know, I think that one of the things that I tried to do as a parent, I tried to take lessons from what my parents did and didn't do with me. And I always tried to keep, to, to learn lessons from those things. What did they do right? What did they do wrong? Um, and I always tried to remember as I was raising my children, I always tried to think back to what was going on in my mind and my, all of the, you know, the turmoil that you go through as a teenager. And I always tried to put myself back in, what was I thinking about at that age? What was I going through? Um, you know, how was I struggling? And, you know, more than anything, I, I just always encouraged my children to be um, independent. And I, I, you know, I wanted them to blossom. I wanted them to do whatever. I wanted them to expand upon their strengths, work on their weaknesses. But more than anything, if, if, if I recognized a certain talent in my kids and they each had their respective talents, I always encouraged them to go for it. And, and just, I always was very positive with them. And, um, you know, regardless of all, and we had a lot of stuff happen in our lives as we were growing up, but it was always the three of us, myself and my two boys, no matter what, we were always there for each other. And, um, you know, I just wanted to be the kind of a parent that would, um, would never smother them, would always encourage them. And, um, you know, I, I think I was very successful and I, I to this day, I it still blows me away how wonderful Justin speaks about me. And I mean, I'm still almost like, wow, he really said that. <laughs> I mean, I just I'm I, I couldn't be more I couldn't be more more proud and and um, just thrilled with what wonderful men both of my sons have turned out to be and they're, they're great husbands today. And I think they have a, a bit of sensitivity from the situations that we encountered. You know, we had alcoholism, we had gambling addiction, we had, you know, we had a lot of things we dealt with. Um, you know, we had Justin's uncle committed suicide. Um, you know, it was, uh, and their dad, of course, was absent. You know, I'm sure you guys heard the story a few years back when Ghost Dad uh, appeared out of nowhere. And, um, you know, but they really had, they had a father figure, but their dad was not in the picture. And um, and that was another thing that was that always worried me. I, I never wanted my boys to be sissy mama's boys. I wanted them to be tough guys. And so... I got them into hockey and Taekwondo and, <laughs> you know, I wanted them to do whatever they could do to prove they could be tough guys. So, um, and they did, they turned out to be tough guys, but also with a sensitivity, uh, sensitive side to them that obviously both their wives appreciate. They have respect for women. And I, that was very important to me. Uh, no, yeah, absolutely. He, hearing hearing you say it and hearing Justin say it, you you did you kind of hit all the points, like all the things that especially a single mom should be going through, uh, especially with the divorce, all that kind of stuff. You you really elevated the family as a whole. But one question that I love to ask people because I love to hear the response on it is, if you could look back at the entire thing of even even from from the time you became your own woman and you started moving out of out of your parents' house until you know, uh, Justin and Eric kind of moved away. Where in there, where's your big regret? Where's the thing that you, that you feel you might've, you know, I didn't, I didn't do that right. Or I could have handled that better. Even if you made it up later, what is that, that key moment for you? Oh, well, the big regret is that I didn't finish college and I didn't get my degree. Hmm. That's my biggest regret. I mean, I was so silly when I talked about leaving Florida state if I had stayed at Florida State, I was going to go on to be a lawyer. Um, you know, that that's my big regret that I did not. And to this day, it continues to haunt me. 
Um, not, you know, not, I don't have a four year degree as much as I tried. I went back to school. I was, you know, trying and trying and I finished my two year degree, but I never got my four year degree. And that's my biggest regret Mm. beyond that. As far as the way the family turned out and everything else, I have no regrets. No regrets. As a matter of fact, everything that we went through, all the ups and downs and all of the the negatives actually, I think, made made us all, myself and both Justin and Eric, made us all very strong. And and it made us all realize that life is just full of um, challenges. And challenges make you stronger. And um, that's, you know, that's that's really been, I, I can't say that I would change any of that. And my only, my only uh, sort of, you know, the way I, I think in my mind, well, Gloria, if you had stayed in Florida State and you did finish up there, then you never would have met your husband. You never would have had your two awesome boys. And who knows how life would have turned out. So don't. Don't regret any of it. And however it turned out, it turned out and it all turned out for the best in the long run. So I'm happy about that. Very good. Uh, Would you be a good president of the United States? (laughs) No, I take things. I take things too personally. (laughs) How did you feel when Justin told you that he voted for you? He wrote you in his ballot. (laughs) I thought it was hilarious. Um, well, because he was really, you know, he was really good with his whole politics, politics, politics podcast. That whole time he kept everybody on in suspense and everybody was on the fence. He never really let it be known, you know, specifically who he was pushing for. And, uh, down to the very end, he kept everybody, uh, in suspense. And I just thought it was absolutely hilarious when he did that. So, um, no, but I would never make a good president because I'm way too sensitive about what people think and what they say. And, um, I, I just don't have the the thick skin to be able to be in a public in the public eye like that. Right. Well, if you could maybe not be the president, but maybe set one policy for a president or, you know, for the, uh, the administration, what, what policy would you like to see put in place? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's a few basic things. Um, you know, we must take care of the environment. And I think that that's an incredibly important uh, aspect of what our politicians do. And um, you need to take care of the people. I mean, the politicians are 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 servants and I don't feel like they are serving us at all. I feel like everything is, everything they do is very self-serving and, um, and I feel like they've lost the, uh, you know, the real mission. I, I'm, I think it's, 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 it's the people and the environment is the most important thing because without those things, the politicians have nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, yeah. without the environment, if our world goes to shit, what are you going to manage? What are you going to govern? You have nothing. Exactly. You know, if the people are all dying and unhappy, what are you, you know, what have you accomplished? So, um, yeah, that's my, that's my, my big thing. Okay. And, um, so so- I'd, I'd vote for you if you ran. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Right. Uh, not, especially considering the alternatives, like it's it's an easy vote. It's simple. <laughs> right. um, we we do we have a few a uh, few more odds and ends questions for you. Um, I know we've covered a lot, and I don't we don't want to hold you up too long today. Uh, but did you ever end up watching The Walking Dead? Oh, good God, no! <laughs> <laughs> no, are you kidding? So, I so... only told him I would to get him off the phone that night. <laughs> How often do you get the random like 2 a.m. phone calls from oh, some? Not, not all that often, but um, <laughs> whenever he does, I mean, he just gets the biggest kick out of call because he knows when I go to sleep, especially during the week. He knows when he's going to catch me at like the most odd time. And um, 
I think he did tell me that night that he was going to call me, uh, but he didn't tell me that Michael Rooker was going to be in the mix. And, you know, he didn't tell me what the topic and all of that stuff, what was going to be going on. So that was a, that was hilarious. But no, I am one of those people. I'm a typical girl. I like movies that, you know, are love stories with that make you feel warm and fuzzy at the end. I don't like killing. I don't like war movies. I don't like walking dead people. I, <laughs> that's just not my thing. So, no, I never. Tim watches. My my significant other watches The Walking Dead, but not me. Not my thing. <laughs> well, I, I think, think I watched I... one episode. That one and Game of Thrones. Neither one of those are my um, are my thing. Oh, yeah. oh now, okay. now, now we just can't be friends. Uh, Game of Thrones is, 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 is the, Game of Thrones is the only TV show left on TV that I still that I will like stop everything I'm doing to watch. Is the well, only and one you that's and left. Obviously, millions of others, but um, I again, I just don't get it. I've watched it a few times, and and within minutes, there's blood spurting everywhere, and I'm like. I don't want to see this. This is not my preference. So I'll just go do something else. Go ahead, Tim. Enjoy it. <laughs> so, yeah, not not my thing. Not my thing. Oh, that's so awesome. So just on, on his shows, uh, every show he ends with a different sign-off. And uh, two shows, uh, I'm referring to the, the Justin Robert Young show and Night Attack in particular, the sign-off are diametrically opposed to each other. Uh, one of them is die in a fire and the other one is please don't die <laughs> what what sign off do you think is the better one and um, should he should he just stick to the one die in a fire I've never even heard him say that <laughs> um, the please don't die I think is probably the better the better sign off I suspected yeah. you would that. yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I um, I've never even heard him do that one, but I haven't watched. Where does he? When does he sign off? Which one does he sign off with? Die in a fire. The Justin Robert Young. That, no, that's that's Night Attack. Uh, Night Attack. One of him, either Brian or him, will will say that at the end of the show. Oh, yeah. okay. Whoever's closing yeah. the show, the other one will will cut that in right at the last second. Um, oh, right. Okay. Now. You you grew up in Southern California. Now I, I grew up in Palmdale, which is uh, just east of LA. It's like a valley and a half east of LA. Okay. Uh, you grew you you were living in San Diego for a while, so I'm, I'm I don't know that the gang scene was was as deep there as it was, kind of like where I, I was on the fringe LA. of like the yeah the LA gang scene. Um, yeah. So I have to ask: Do you know any gang signs? No. No. <sighs> Because we we just have one one in this show that we we like to throw up at the towards the end of the show and it's it's this right here. Oh well, that's the Diamond Club sign. Right, right. So so you know the Diamond Club gang sign, right? I know the Diamond Club, but is that a gang sign? Is uh, that a gang sign? Oh yeah, that's totally it's, it's it's yeah it's totally our gang sign. It's our gang sign. Oh it's, okay, so it's, a, it's like a good gang sign, right? It's a good gang sign. Yeah. Um, uh, Go ahead, Kent. I, I know there's, there's. I was just gonna say I was I was hoping that that we could get a a screenshot of the three of us throwing up the diamonds together. Oh, okay. You want to do that now? There we go. All right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. That, we're um, probably gonna make that cover like the cover art for this episode. Okay. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. Um. There. Uh, so we were we were sitting right at about an hour, and we kind of I kind of promised you that we wouldn't be going too long. Um, when, when Justin tells you that he's built this community, that he's part of a, a, a bigger thing with his, with his friend, Brian, who he knows largely over the internet and, um, as a mutual friend of an, you know, of Andrew Maine, and he, he comes and tells you like, Hey, I'm going to do, you know, blah, 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 this crazy internet thing. I'm going to do live shows or whatever else as a mom. What is your what is your what is your gut feeling when he does? Because you've talked about how you support him when he goes. He just goes on these crazy ideas, but but like you know, just just when you see your son cr try these absolutely insane things that he's done, <laughs> what is your gut feeling inside? You know, 
when he first started with some of this stuff, because he used to do like talking heads and he would do these but before he really started with the podcasting. He would do a lot of bizarre things. And I would always just say to him, Justin, how are you going to make money? You're going to need to make money. How are you going to make money? And he'd be like, don't worry, mom, don't worry, don't worry. You know, it'll all come. And I have to back up for a moment because Andrew Maine, I always loved Andrew. And Andrew was had already graduated from high school when Justin was still in high school. And Andrew used to come back at like once a week and he would do like a little, um, I don't know what they call it. I think they called it the monkey man show or something goofy. And, um, and I met Andrew a few times and I remember saying to Justin, he is going to be successful. Make sure you stay in touch with Andrew Maine. Well, sure enough, after Justin graduated from Syracuse, left, um, uh, left Syracuse and went down to New York and worked for about a year in the city. And then he came to work directly for Andrew. And um, that was when he first started to do some of this initial podcasting. I think he was doing the Weird Things podcast. And, and still to that point, I was like, I have no idea how you're going to make money on this, Justin. This is just kind of ridiculous. But I'm like, whatever. You know, he was already living on his own and he was supporting himself. And I'm like, okay, good luck. I don't know what you're doing, but whatever it is, as long as you can support yourself and you're happy and your creative side is being satisfied, then go for it. So, you know, then when Patreon came about, and they were able to actually start getting paid for this craziness. I was like, this is awesome. And I'm absolutely thrilled that he can just talk to all of his fans through the internet and, and that he's making a, a very nice living and all of the things that all of his little side projects, his, you know, the card games and everything else that he thinks of. I'm just like blown away. I, I couldn't be happier for him. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled and um, very proud of him. And, you know, when people ask me today, what does your son do? I'm like, well, he's a new media journalist. He's a podcaster. He's an entrepreneur. He's making a great living and I'm happy for him. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was all very skeptical about it, but I can't ever see Justin working in a traditional office job. He would be miserable. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would never want to see him that way. So now he's doing everything he loves and he's making a good living. And what more can a mom ask for? Right? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 think I think it's awesome. Great. Yeah, Amos and I hope to one day escape the uh, office and traditional work to do stuff like this full time. A full time. Yeah. I, I, I just want a job where I don't have to put my name on my shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. Like it's not. Yeah. My 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 aspirations are not overly high. Uh, <laughs> so well, you we'll know. Get, go, uh, go ahead. Sorry. When when um when Justin was getting ready to start. I think it was he was leaving elementary school and getting ready to start middle school. And the middle school that he was going to go to in South Florida was real sketchy. I was real concerned about it. It was just in a bad neighborhood. It just was not a good school. And I couldn't afford to send them to a private school. And um, so at that time, they had started what they called a magnet program. I don't know if they have those around where you guys live or if you know what they are, but that was to attract certain schools were offering certain programs that they were trying to attract a, a different level of student and they would bus you in and all of this. So um, the magnet school that I encouraged Justin to go to was a journalism program. And in my mind, I thought to myself, that sounds like something that would fit for Justin. And sure enough, I, my, it was spot on because not only did he carry that journalism through middle school 
into high school and then into college where you know that he started college like one week before 9-11 mm-hmm. and he had just gotten a job on Daily Orange, which was the off campus newspaper. Uh, literally, he started they they started the job on he started the job on Friday. They told him, yeah, you're in. You got to start on Monday. And 9-11 was hit on Tuesday. So, you know, he hit the ground running. And he said he learned more about journalism working at the Daily Orange than he did in all of his journalism programs at Syracuse. But he did have both sides. He had the practical world working at the Daily Orange, and then he had this great training at the Newhouse School at at Syracuse. And, um, you know, between the two, as much as he says college is a sham, between the two, all the contacts that he made there, and, you know, just his experience of working in the paper. And, you know, that was all just tremendous, um, just a tremendous experience for him. So it really turned out to be the best I had. That one little inkling of, I think this might be good for Justin, turned out to really, it, it changed his life. So, or at least put him on the course of his life. So what you're saying is, it's your fault we had a Charmander suit on the convention floor. <laughs> that's that's what we're getting at here. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. So, um, anyway. Can't, do you have anything else? Because I think we're... we're we're kind of no. I, I think I've I think we've covered all of the direct questions that I had. I was going to uh, point the listeners to where they might be able to find Gloria on the internet. Oh, uh, I'm not. I do have. A, I am on Twitter. Um, I think that's where I'm Glowbug Young, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't really do much on Twitter. If I want to know what Justin or Ashley's doing, I look at Twitter. Um, but beyond that, I don't do a whole lot on there. I don't ever really tweet. I'm on Facebook, Gloria Anzalone Young. Uh, I'm not actually friends with a lot of Justin's fans. So anyone else that wants to friend me on Facebook, I'm more than happy to, um, accept their friend request. And, um, that's pretty much it. All right. Thank you so much, Gloria, for allowing us to ask you all of these questions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's It's been wonderful hearing you talk. And um, yeah, I just I, I loved this interview so much. Thank you so much. For- I'm glad it was my pleasure. And thank you for having me. And um, maybe we'll talk again soon. Be awesome. I would like that. Thank all you. All so right, much. guys. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>